Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jared Moon here with Kosh Rump, Joe Courtney, and Ashley Hicks. How's it going, guys? Hey, hey, hey. And girl. Hello. I don't know how to respond. Just threw it in there real what fast. What just happened? Yeah, you know, there's no reason to... Now, now we're talking about it. Already wasting the time I was trying to save. Okay. <laughs> Ashley, how's life? Good. Um, just... Again, doing my thing, and uh, we are on week two for all of the site for the cycle for all the tracks. So um, I've been doing women's health track, and we've been counting macros with the women's health track. And so I decided I was going to jump in and do the same. And I just found out that I was under eating, and I didn't think I was under eating. I didn't feel like I was under eating, but I feel a whole lot better, and I don't have an afternoon crash. And actually, Emily and I were talking about this when you and her visited us. And um, I didn't know if it was due to my Hashimoto's, to my thyroid. And it ended up being, I potentially just needed probably more food, more protein. So um, kind of cool to, you know, just tracking your macros can kind of put you back on track and kind of see what you uh, uh, what you need to be doing. But yeah, other than that, uh, I have, I caved and I have a mask now for when I go grocery shopping and, um, base the boys have, no, there's nothing wrong with it. And the base, um, you have to be, you have to wear a mask now. And so, um, Scott and the boys, his squadron, their mascot is the gorilla. So they're going to get like gorillas sewn onto this <laughs> scarf. So. I've seen some pretty interesting ones already. Yeah. Yeah. Like Hunter Camo here in Texas and Shocker. All, sorts of, all sorts of cool. <laughs> I you want you probably want a Maryland one, right, Joe? Heck yeah, I'll wear anything Maryland <laughs> I think I have a Maryland bandana. That does not surprise me. So Joe, on to you, man. How's life? It was good until I did the stupid Zone 2 Murph. Mm-hmm. He's so angry about Zone 2 Murph. So angry. It was, it, he like just did it. I don't know why today of all days, but you like you just completed it like an hour ago, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's weather has been in and out, wishy-washy, kind of crappy in Maryland. And the next two or three days, three or four days, actually, it's going to be crappy. And I can do the rest of the week of Endure indoors. So, I decided to switch things up and do something outside because it's super nice today. Nice. And I don't regret it, but it's still stupid. Yeah. So just what are your thoughts, man? Now that we got you fresh, you know, it's not yeah. often that you get to record a podcast like right after Meet Yourself Saturday has ended. So what do you hate about it? Why does it, why is it awful? It was good for a while. And then it, I don't know if it was, I, I like to see, uh, compare my time with other people that are wearing chest straps because I feel like it just had the most accurate reading of it. Um, Push-ups, for some reason, I would get down for like making my body horizontal doing the push-ups. My, uh, my heart rate would go way down. So like I could drop down and do push-ups and just do them as fast as I could. And my, my heart rate would go straight down. But then I'd do a squat and then it's like one squat and it, then I would have to wait like 10 seconds or just breathe super slow through the squats. <laughs> and it was just so frustrating. Yeah, it's um, a very, very frustrating uh, workout. Was the, did the chest strap get loose when you would push? Is that... Nope. It, no? it, it's pretty tight and it's uh, elastic. It, I kept on having to pull it up. Uh, so I probably need to make it tighter. Um, but it would, there would be random times where it would spike either up or down. So I don't know what was going on with that, but the, the heart rate and my, uh, you, you, I can set zone two alerts on Garmin and some of the times the alerts weren't going off. Uh, so that was kind of just odd. So I was kind of staring at my watch for a while, but it wasn't too bad. It, like pacing wise, I was fine with it, but then it was just toward the end where I was like, am I really about to get freaking capped on this? And I just got pissed. Yeah, it was on I, the very last quarter mile that I got capped. Yeah, I was like, I had point two of a mile left, and I got capped. So, <laughs> so I did wear a chest strap, and which was annoying because a chest strap with a vest on is super annoying. 
it's Wait, like, you do zone two Murph with a vest? I do. It's competitor. Yeah. And it it is basically an hour of staring at my watch. Like yeah, for every sure. second. <laughs> and I only had one, I mean, I know we have different chest straps, but there was only one time where um I was like doing the workout and it my heart rate dro- it said it dropped to like 46. I'm like doing push-ups and like I look and it's like 46. I'm like, it's not right. It's <laughs> not right. I am moving my body right now. Um, so yeah, the just the monitor can be annoying in that workout if it's not perfect. But I, I wear chest strap too just because I know it's way more accurate uh, than a wrist wrist reading most of the time. Yeah. Did you so, wear like a whoop in one arm and then your Apple Watch on the other since you're back on whoop? <laughs> no, I... Uh, Zone, since I don't have a interface on the whoop, like anything where I need to know what zone I'm in. I mean, you can use your phone, but since there's a run component, right. I don't like to run with my phone. If it's just in the garage, like with um, uh, fat and sugar, you know, I can mm-hmm. just do that in the garage. I'll use my whoop with the phone app on, but um, anything else like that, I'm going to use Apple Watch and a chest strap. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of controlling of the breathing. And then I was fine until... I got on the run and I did the math and I was like, I'm really not going to finish this. And it's just done. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would say next time, but I think you already said there won't be a next time. That's might, how much might you be a while. I gotta get, I gotta get over this thing. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's like how I feel after every hundred mile bike race. I'm like, I'm not doing that again. That was dumb. And then <laughs> two months later, I'm like, all right, let's try it again. <laughs> Kyle, how's life? Or do you have anything else, Joe? We only talked about... I mean, I got all kinds of stuff, but I could just always, you know, push it to next week. <laughs> all right, man. All right. It's up to you. Uh, Kyle. Um, so, Hannah and I celebrated six years of wedded bliss on Sunday. Congratulations. So, that was a big deal. She listens to the podcast, doesn't she? No. <laughs> 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 Which I tell her that, like, hey, you're like half of my updates on the podcast. And I think that actually gives her more incentive to not listen. She doesn't oh, really want to hear what? what I have to say. Makes sense. Um, about yeah, I, I didn't know you were family. married for like a solid year. <laughs> 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 Kidding. Uh, if it's yeah. not on the podcast, it's not true. Right. Uh, so my zone two experience, I actually PR'd it, but I only got two extra rounds of calisthenics done. So it was still very, very frustrating. And a lot of watch watching watch watching yeah um watch, watch I, watching yes watch gazing watch. trampus new shirt idea watch watching oh, no. watch watching <laughs> yeah um yeah frustrating i don't think my fitbit is really helping me out with the whole monitoring situation so i think i've complained about fitbit before and i think it was last time i did zone 2 murph is the last time i complained about it but Probably need to go the chest strap route to maybe see if it was accurate or not. But typically, like I'm looking at my watch and I'm out of zone two. So I stop so that I can get back down to zone two. And instead of going down, my heart rate spikes. And I'm like, I'm resting. How is my heart rate going up when I'm mm-hmm. not moving? I don't understand. So and there's lag time in these things, right? Like there's always the lag. I mean, in it depends on your monitor, but some of them, especially like with the whoop, like Apple watch is instantaneous readout. Cause it's like right there on whoop has to communicate with your phone to tell you what your heart rate is for you to be able to see it through Bluetooth connection. So there's at least like a second lag there. And I've mm-hmm. noticed that more prominent with, with whoop than uh, Apple watch, but I don't know. I've never even had a Fitbit, so I don't, yeah. so, I, have, I have no idea. I got this one for free. So free is always good. Yep. But yeah, I'll probably be investing in some different monitoring devices before I do zone two next time. Yeah, a lot of questions pop up about that. I think Polar is the best place to start if people are interested because they have fairly inexpensive, um, like Whoop, these days you're looking at a monthly fee if you want to wear a Whoop. Apple Watch is hundreds of dollars. Uh, and I think Polar, you can get like in the one to $200 range or even less than a hundred, but they have so many different uh, you know, models, it would depend on what you want to do. But for some basic heart rate tracking, I think Polar would be be the best for anyone out there who who's thinking about getting a uh, heart rate monitor. 
All right. Updates from me, Ryan Caswell, uh, kind of challenged me to a double under competition. Oh yeah. With a one pound jump rope. <laughs> and so I was like, uh, it, he, he posted in the, in the Facebook group and, uh, you know, we were kind of going back and forth about it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. I did not pay attention to the details at all. And I went out in the garage and grabbed my rope and I started, I was like, I, this is just going to be my warm up today. I'm just going to do double unders with my heavy rope and see if I can beat Ryan Caswell because he challenged me. And I could only do five reps, 10 reps, 15, 20 at the absolute worst. I kept busting my toes. Okay, busting your toes with a heavy rope, it, like they're still bruised. And I'm pretty sure they were bleeding that day. And then I was like, this guy is like a jump rope god. Like how is, how is he getting, because he did like 66 double unders with a one pound rope. I was like, how is this even possible? So I pulled up my phone about halfway through my little warm up of, of failure and then looked and he, that's when I found out he was using a one pound rope and I was using a two pound rope. <laughs> and for some reason the difference there is significant and very painful. Very, very painful. Uh, anyway, I switched to one mm -hmm. pound. And so now he wants to see if he can get 150 in a row with a one pound rope, which is going to be awful. So I'm kind of working on that this cycle, just in spare time, maybe on Thursdays and Sundays or something like that. I'm going to try it out. The most I've been able to do was like, I think I got around 75. So I'm only halfway there. So that could be a full 12 weeks worth of work. I'm not even 100% sure it's possible. For It's it's significant. It's, yeah, I really want to join you in this endeavor, but I have to buy the ropes, and those are like 130 bucks. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah, yeah, like to get decent ones. So, I mean, that'd be great because I can travel with them, but it's still, it's a big cost. Yeah, they, I'm not going to lie, I didn't pay for mine. I, <laughs> I did get mine for free. No sponsor. They didn't, that was like, Six years ago, in all honesty, <laughs> like when when the their company Crossrope got started, they sent me uh, their kit and uh, yeah. But again, not sponsored or anything. Yeah, um, Crossrope. If you want to, you know, have any donations, no sponsors, but you know, if you want to donate a couple of yeah, those. if you want to send Joe some ropes, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. Uh, first week of Hard to Kill. I just want to say I'm so so glad to be back on Hard to Kill. First completed week. It is just nice. Um, I think I was getting a little bit of training ADD because things like strength and endure are so focused on a certain domain and hard to kill moves around a little bit more. It's just, uh, it's really helpful. And so that's it. I love it. Uh, and none of you are on it. So whatever. <laughs> we all just abandoned ship. Yeah. I didn't. Uh, but what I wanted to say about zone two Murph was a lot of people, are finishing the workout. I don't know. Not many people finished it the first time uh, in, in our training. And a lot of people are getting real close, like just over an hour or just under an hour finishing zone two Murph. And I posted this in the group, but I wanted to just like say it to all the athletes just in case people missed it. But the best uh, analogy I have is like a frog in boiling water. You know how like a frog gets put in boiling water and you raise the temperature. There, there have been debates whether or not that's even even true. But anyway, I feel like that's what happens to our athletes. They don't realize like, they're like, Oh, maybe I'll try this meet yourself Saturday workout, whatever, like their first one. And they do it. And now they're doing it every Saturday. Next thing you know, they're signed up for a beast in a, in a Spartan race. And then, you know, these things like people don't realize how far they've come with this stuff, but being able to complete Murph with a heart rate cap and under an hour is a significant athletic feat. Like if you had an athletic resume, it should be on there. And I don't think people really truly un, uh, you know realize what they're capable of if they're doing that so props to all the athletes who have made it that far um and if you haven't that's okay because you could just get better with time <laughs> zone two being 60 to 70 percent which oh yeah that's a huge if you emphasize. use the zone zones app i think they make you pay to have five heart rate zones is that yeah, right that's that's the only way you can get if not then your heart rate your zone two is like way well into the 70s which how is much a huge it, difference how much does it cost do you guys remember i think it's like three like, bucks or something yeah it's like two or three bucks. yeah i never some people are weird about buying apps i always buy an app like if they're like you can use this app but it's gonna have ads i'm like how do i not have ads they're like a dollar i'm like great here's a dollar <laughs> And, and so, you know, I'd rather have full functionality. So the same with zones app. 
uh, get it because that's the only way you can use five zones. If you're using four zones, your zones are wrong. Uh, we had some athletes post about that. They're like, yeah, I stayed in zone two the whole time. And they're like in 70 to 80% at zone two with four zones. And I'm like, that's, that was a hard effort. That was a really hard effort to stay in that. Uh, so just be mindful of that or pay attention to those things. Also be mindful that the zone app does not sync with Fitbit, which I found out after I paid for the app. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, whoop doesn't sync with anything. If that makes you feel better. Like I've been, well, you're paying, you're paying a whole, like for a whole package with whoop. So I kind of understand that, but yeah, it's I mean, like, no, they'll break it down into zones that. for you. Yeah. Well, they won't, okay. they won't integrate with Apple health and that does frustrate yeah. me. Like I wish yeah. whoop would do that. The, the only reason they don't is because of, they don't want you to have all your data if you leave them. That's it. Sure. Yep. Anyway. All right. <laughs> uh, then the last update for me, the book, uh, I told you guys before we started recording, every part of the book is with someone who needs to be doing something, but everything is done. And so I will have an official date. I'm hoping the next podcast of the, when the book will launch. I don't want to commit to that until everyone else who's doing work on the book, whether that's editing, formatting, copywriting, all those things until they have completed all those things. But everyone's really close. Um, but all of my work is done. I just have to get the book now. So next podcast or the podcast after, I will have a definite, here's when the book is coming out and how to get it type um, announcement just for anyone wondering. <laughs> all right, now let's get into the study. Today's study is about hyperventilation for performance. The actual name of the study is hyperventilation aided recovery for extra repetitions on bench press and leg press by Sakamoto. And it was done this year. All right. So here are the key takeaways. There were 11 trained men, sorry, Ashley, who participated <laughs> in this study. They averaged almost seven years of resistance training experience and all participated in sports that rely on strength or power to some degree. Seven throwers, two rugby players, one Judy player. Yeah, I didn't know what that was. Oh, I don't know what that I'm is sure either. Judy is. And one sprinter. Uh, so subjects completed six sets of bench press and leg press to failure on two separate occasions. They breathed normally before some sets and hyperventilated for the last 30 seconds of the preceding rest period before other sets. Uh, and drum roll, please. Ultimately, there's like a 27.8% increase in performance, which equated to like 1 to 2.2 to 2.3 rep increase. So around a 30% de uh, increase in performance through hyperventilation before a set. Um, and it was, it was a little bit less on the bench and a little bit more on the leg press, uh, which makes sense. Yeah, 1.3 to 2.3 extra reps per set and 27 to 35% increase in total number of reps completed. So that's huge. That's huge. And so we get to talk about it now, um, dive into it now that I, you know, I like getting all the, uh, the takeaway out first and then we can discuss it a little bit more, but Ashley, what were your thoughts on this one? Um, I agreed with you. I think that 30%, that's a, a big difference. Um, and then my takeaway for this was that it makes sense to me in the way that when you take a deeper breath after your hyperventilation period, I feel like breath support works with your lifts. Um, breathing has been a huge deal. I had to learn how to breathe with weightlifting because, again, you know, I came from a background of no weightlifting before, um, before like 2010. But yeah, so that made sense to me that you know maybe there was more breath support because it was deeper because you had to take a deeper breath because you had to recover from the hyperventilation period, um, which would in turn, I guess, allow you to do more reps or lift more. Um, but it seems like it would be good for other movements. And they even talked about it in the breakdown of it that, you know, for tricep extensions, this probably would do nothing, you know, versus, I don't know, maybe deadlifts or squats or something like that. But for me, I guess my takeaway is that it's a big difference, but I don't know if I would personally do it just because it's, I don't know, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. Like let's make yourself hyperventilate and then you're going to lift some heavy weights or do an extra rep of a heavy weight. And I'm like, Ooh, I don't know how I, how I feel about that. Yeah. I'm there with you. <laughs> you can tell me all the good benefits of it, but kind of like uh, eggplant, I might not participate. <laughs> 
So that's that's very interesting. Breathing is like a is where you guys draw the line. That's that's awesome. I, I didn't say draw the line. <laughs> I'm not going to test it out on a back squat. I will tell you that. <laughs> like, yeah. And that, that was going to be some of my takeaways is like, I'll get into more how I think you should test it and, and getting into it. But uh, Joe, what were some of your takeaways? Well, it was a very small study. Um, but as I was reading it, one of the things that I was thinking of uh, was, could the hyperventilation be causing people's adrenaline to rise? And because like, if you're becoming shorter of breath, would your adrenaline go up? And therefore you can lift more. And so that was kind of a thought for me. I know they, they tested a bunch of blood stuff, a bunch of things that I really didn't understand, um, <laughs> whether you might dive into as well, but, mm -hmm. and the structure of the study, it would be, I think it'd be cool to see them structured a bit differently because they were doing it every other, uh, every other set. Mm -hmm. So they would do one hyperventilation, one, not one hyperventilation, one, not. And I was just thinking like, okay, if I were doing this, I'd be hyperventilating and then it's like, okay, yeah, I'm, it's going to feel like I'm going to give, give my all and do this. And then I'm going to rest. And it's like, okay, just do another set. Well, mentally I'm not going to be as dialed in or checked in to do that other set. It's just going to feel like a recovery set. So that could have also played in a factor to me for this giant 30% uh, increase. So I'm not saying that like it could have its own benefits and they, they discussed as to why it would have so many, but I think there was, it'd be cool to test it a different way to like maybe do your hyperventilation sets in a row or have those at the very end versus every other kyle will you will, for, i gotta start with are you willing to try it am i willing to try it yeah absolutely okay great yes great okay and i'm on now, the on, strength track i was gonna so say you're on the strength track to, i feel like you to need to it. yeah and, all right so what else, what else you got <laughs> well first of all i thought this is an interesting method it's probably <laughs> something that would get you some funny looks if you weren't a garage gym athlete if you were working out in a regular gym and you were hyperventilating before you're set you know just imagine that in your head as yeah, i keep talking bring a paper bag I mean, into the gym <laughs> those are the kind of things that happen at a globo gym just true. standard like everyday type stuff that's true that's true um i would say they they pointed out that it could potentially lower your recovery time um this study didn't really dive into that as deeply i think as as maybe we would want but it could potentially lower your recovery time where you could finish your workout more quickly, uh, get the same amount of work in, in less time potentially, which I think is a positive for, for those of us who are working out at home and having to, um, carve out time in our day to do this kind of stuff. Um, but I would also say practice it before you do it in an actual workout. And they put that in the study too, or at least in the breakdown, they put, you know, a caveat, Hey, you need to practice this before you, you know, especially if you've got weight on your back, you know, or and, bench press, like, yeah, yeah, d maybe, maybe don't do it for bench press until you've done it for something else. I would or say. back squat. I, I yeah. think that you should start on the deadlift. That's my official, because yeah. if really, if you're going to pass out, there's no good place to pass out in a gym. Like, but yeah. that's why you should try it. You should try hyperventilating, hyperventilating without lifting first. And yeah. then after that, go through the safest. Let's do some air squats. <laughs> yeah, like then you could go deadlift because if you were to like feel really lightheaded, you could just drop the weight and like, you know, kneel to the ground and, and make mm -hmm. sure you're not going to have like a fall or something like that. But you pass out on bench press, um, you might not be alive anymore. Back yeah. squat, mm -hmm. you know, severe injury or whatever. So there, there are some considerations to take into account. What I thought was interesting from the study is that they specifically said that not one single person got where not one single person got dizzy, mm -hmm. uh, felt uncomfortable, had chest pain, anything. I mean, I know it's only 11 people, but you would think, um, yeah, no dizziness, tingling, or chest discomfort from any of the subjects or adverse reactions to hyperventilation. Uh, so that, I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, I think that also goes to the fact that they're in a lab with people who are directing them specifically, Hey, this is how we want you to do this. And so I think before you even do it with weight, even on a deadlift, you know, like you said, like, practice what hyperventilating looks like and you know practice the breathing without any weight without any movement maybe just kind of standing in your gym like this is what hyperventilating looks like and what it feels like and then after you understand okay this is how to actually do it then you kind of add it to you know the safest lift possible before you move on to something else but yes i'm willing to try it okay so Absolutely. let's let's talk about what it looks like for any athletes uh willing to try it 
from the study, essentially around 25 fast, deep breaths be, you know, for, for 30 seconds. So you're looking at almost one breath per second for 30 seconds. So it's just 30 seconds. Uh, I have done a lot of breath work for several years. And I do think, I do remember and recall when I started, I did get things like um, lightheadedness or I'd feel weird just doing normal breathing exercises. That doesn't really happen to me anymore just because it's something I've practiced, not practiced in the weight room. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. Like just, uh, you know, box breathing, Wim Hof method, all these different breathing practices that are more a form of a meditation and, you know, stress relief and things like that. That's why I do uh, breathing practices. But like I said, being very comfortable with that, these 25 deep breaths, if you've never done it before, will, if you haven't done any breath work, I can almost guarantee you're going to feel something like it might not be lightheadedness, but you're going to feel something. Uh, and so just keep that in mind and give it a try. And like we said, you know, start with just doing uh, hyperventilation breathing by yourself, um, or not necessarily by yourself, but with no weights involved, no fitness involved. And then you can, you can try, you know, maybe deadlift or kettlebell deadlift or something that's not going to be super dangerous. So I think it's definitely worth a try because it's, it's free. It's easy. It doesn't take anything. And well, you know, we've uh, studied like beats, um, for performance before, and this beats out, beats out beats and also bicarbonate. I've tried bicarbonate. Have you, I don't know if you guys have, have, um, I tried that like probably 2015, um, because it's really big in like the endurance world for improving endurance. And that one didn't really work for me. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have any of the like big stomach problems that people normally talk about, but it just, I didn't find it helpful to be honest. I didn't. And then like how much you have to consume, you know, was it's almost like the caffeine thing, like how much you have to consume for it to be to matter. Like, is it really worth it? But this is just breathing. So mm -hmm. I'm, if, if I wanted to do some breathing exercises and slam some beetroot juice before I get started, let's go, you know, let's, let's human. get all the science for my performance. <laughs> you know, let, let's do it. Uh, so I think it's definitely, definitely worth a shot and it's really cool. Uh, but one, a couple other things I just wanted to mention, this was specifically looking at strength endurance. So how many reps can you perform at, at different given intensities? Uh, but in the endurance world, which I've been just doing a lot of like research on over the last, let's say year and a half, the better endurance coach uh, coaches out there and programming have a breathing element to it and coaching you on that because you have carbon dioxide is a waste product of your body. You don't want it. And so the more it doesn't get expelled, the more it builds up in, in your blood. And so, uh, I know in a lot of endurance training, they want you to breathe all the way out. You know, th these kind of things, like people talking about like a bracing breath and strength training, that's, that's maybe all you'll hear about when you're talking about breathing and strength training is like, you know, bracing up against a belt or like how to breathe in between reps. But the fact that you need to look at carbon uh, dioxide as a waste product that you're getting rid of completely. So exhale, exhaling as much as you can and then inhaling through the nose because you can expand more of your lungs when you breathe through the nose as opposed to your mouth. Like these are things that are really common in the endurance world that I guess are finding their way to the strength training world. That's what I found interesting about this study um, because that's something when I'm on like um, on my bike, I'm thinking about that almost the entire time I'm riding is like breathing all the way out and then breathing back in because I don't want to like be taking these short crappy breaths that aren't really like fueling me how they should. Uh, I was going to try this this week, but I forgot. Like that was weird. Like I wrote down the protocol on how to do it and I went outside and then just forgot. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, uh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the mm -hmm. double unders that screwed me up. Um, the anger and frustration and bloody toes of the <laughs> double unders, but I am going to try it. So I should have an update the next time we podcast on, I, I'll probably do it several weeks in a row to see if I really feel like it helped me at all. I, my guess is going to be like, not much. Um, I don't think it's going to help me that much. I mean, there's a 30% increase, but it's so hard when you're not under like a scientific protocol like this, because like bench press this week, we did as many reps as possible at 65%. Um, and you know, it's like, okay, would I have gotten one more rep? I don't have like anything else to compare it to. Um, and so it's harder to, harder to say, but over, over a long enough timeline, something I'm definitely willing to, to look at. So yeah, give it a try. I think everyone should Ashley and Joe, like, come on. Mm -hmm. This week would have been perfect for a woman's health track. Cause it was as many reps as you could do in 60 seconds. So too bad. It's gone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, yeah. Any athletes out there want to try it? Be safe. Um, 
but I think it's definitely worth a shot. It's another tool, beetroot juice and, and breathing. I think it would be probably helped too if you had some kind of regular breathing practice where you're not just doing the hyperventilation in your workouts where like you're doing something like Wim Hof or you're doing something like box breathing on a regular basis where your body's just kind of used to breathing more intentionally. And then you probably would be able to utilize that more in training, the hyperventilation in training, if your body's just kind of used to breathing intentionally on a regular basis. Yeah. I, I know I had to get way more intentional about my breathing when I first started to get into higher intensity training like a decade ago, because I would just, my breathing would get so out of whack. I, like I'd have to like stop and be like, okay, I don't even know what's going on right now. And, uh, it's, it's been a long journey on, on the breathing for me, but it's coming along. Cool. Well, go give it a try guys. If you do it, let us know how it works. If you hurt yourself, you didn't hear it here. <laughs> All right. Topic this week. What is the most impactful fitness, health, nutrition related book you have ever read and why? What was your biggest takeaway from said book or books? Joe, what you got, man? So Kyle and I were kind of on the same deep nutrition page, but I, I can easily pivot to Wired to Eat because Wired to Eat by Rob Wolf was one of the first ones that I read. And I think it's just a fantastic book on where to start. And it's actually one that I would recommend before reading deep nutrition because it's, it's an easier one to, to digest a bit. It's not as, as dense into the science. But the way that he, he structures the book and he goes through it, it's, it's really well, well read and um, he gets you know, really good examples from it. It was also awesome because we, I think I read that shortly after Whole30, which his um, diet reset is very, very similar, except a lot of times with Whole30 or those 30-day diet resets is that it's like, okay, then you introduce this and see how you feel, write down how you feel. But with, but with Rob's, he actually gives you a, hey, test your blood, test your, your glucose levels, and it will actually tell you what is doing what. Even if you don't feel it, you'll actually be able to know what is affecting your body and what isn't, and then just get rid of it. So I think it's, it's cool to have that sort of parameters as well. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just a, a really, really good, well-rounded, uh, place to start for as far as nutrition goes. Yeah. I love his seven day carb test. I've done it with multiple different carbohydrates. So you essentially fast for a long period of time and you would, yeah, like you said, you, I think you're supposed to have done the diet reset first. And then, uh, after whatever, 12 plus hours of fasting, you have like 150 grams of a, of one carbohydrate like white rice then you wait two hours and you test your blood glucose and if it's above a certain level like it might not be a carbohydrate that you're you want to i think it's like 120 it's pretty high so i mm -hmm. think um yeah anyway i've done that with like oatmeal i've done it with rice i've done it with a lot of different carbohydrates just to see how my body reacts and that was really good to know about you know kind of individualizing things for yourself so i love that book as well um ashley Mine has to do with um, my Hashimoto's diagnosis. So uh, my mother-in-law actually bought this book for me and I always assume it was called Root Cause because it just had trees and some roots and it's by, it's actually called Hashimoto's Thyroiditis Lifestyle Interventions for Finding and Treating the Root Cause by Isabella Wentz. Um, and I know she's come out with another one. Actually, I think Emily actually read it, Jared, that it's like a 90-day plan for Hashimoto's. and this book helped me identify uh, the reasons why my thyroid was out of whack. I mean, I went to a doctor, I saw an endocrinologist, um, and basically he asked me to go gluten-free because he thought I potentially had an allergy, and he actually did some testing on me, and we found out that I did have an allergy to that. Um, but there was other things in the book that she explained, like high inflammatory foods as uh, well as um, birth control. Most females are on uh, as to what that does to your body and why your thyroid is trying to make up for it, which in turn makes it go out of whack. So um, yeah, it definitely helped me. And um, yeah, I basically took what she said in the book and tried to put as many things into practice as I could that um, like taking birth control, I eliminated that, not doing dairy, gluten, high inflammatory foods, and basically never looked back. And um, I have, to this day, still have never been on thyroid medication. And yeah, so. So I have a question. 
toward that. Uh, so I actually have that book. I have not read it yet, mm-hmm. but it's it's something that I'm thinking about reading. And would you say that pe- it would be good for people to read that don't necessarily have that diagnosis? Like there's other nuggets of, like even if they just have a, like, so genetically, I think my family kind of has a thyroid issue, but not necessarily Hashimoto's. So like for anybody with anybody with thyroid issues that they get older, would, would you say there's nuggets of stuff to take away from it? Yeah. So she actually talks on hyper and hypothyroidism. Um, so that, and I always think why not learn about other things, even if you don't have it. Um, and if this is affecting people, um, so much that it's causing them to have a thyroid issue, why not try and eliminate or use some of the tools that she says to then help yourself. And yeah, you might find something that you're like, Oh man, maybe I should try this. Um, I will say, I have found that um, certain chapters are geared more towards females uh, versus males, but I know you can definitely get some stuff out of it, Joe. And I think just on those, that kind of topic, I I really would like to encourage people to like go get blood tests and stuff like, and and work with a, a doctor who knows what they're talking about, know the difference between within normal limits and then functional rep, uh, you know, functional ranges because they're very different. Um, and I think that's about all I can leave people with, uh, because there's, um, and this is not just for, uh, you know, thyroid numbers. This is for like basically every result you can get, uh, within blood. There's going to be within normal limits, which is just the, like that lab, like say lab core has like an entire, range of people they've tested over a certain period of time for that same parameter. And they're going to say, Hey, you're within the average of, you know, the, the 5,000 people we tested over the last, you know, month or, you know, whatever it is. Problem with that is most people are not like you. If you're, if you're working out all the time, healthy, all these things. So I don't want my testosterone levels, cholesterol levels, all, you know, whatever. I don't want them to be within the average of an American. I want them right. to be <laughs> exceptional. And that's the same with like thyroid stuff. And so figuring that stuff out can be the hard part. I know Emily and I, uh, we started working with a functional uh, med doc uh, last year and, and into this year for a lot of these things. And, that's, you know, she started getting blood work, I did. And so just dialing things in a lot more, um, it can, you can go down a lot of rabbit holes, but I don't, uh, like just guessing at some things, um, if you don't have a diagnosis, like Ashley had a specific diagnosis is is a dangerous game and you're just going to be, that's what, that's what gets annoying with like, I feel like you can, you can fix a lot of things with nutrition, but if you don't truly know if something is wrong, then you can go down so many rabbit holes. You could spend the rest of your life trying different protocols to fix a problem and maybe never fix it. So blood work can be expensive, but you know, hopefully it's covered by your insurance, whatever, just get it, get it done. Like get it tested. If you're going to dive down deep into these uh, different things. Kyle, so deep nutrition, man. Yeah, that's it. I had to steal it away from Joe. Actually, it would have been deep nutrition or wired to eat. So Joe and I are on the same page with that. But nice. um, I agree with him that wired to eat is a lot. To me, it's a lot more practical just for the regular person. But deep nutrition for me was just so eye opening to a lot of different things that I didn't think about with nutrition that weren't even on my radar with nutrition. So just kind of, it really expanded my horizons, the way that I think about nutrition a lot differently than uh, Wired to Eat did. Wired to Eat's a a really practical book that I think anybody can put into practice, but deep nutrition, it's kind of like, I mean, it's heavy. I mean, it's big. It's, it's like a textbook. I mean, there's a lot of it in there, but um, yeah, almost. (laughs) And I think uh, the biggest thing, well, there were two big things that I took away. First of all, she talks a lot about vegetable oils in that Mm -hmm. book and how they're basically very bad for you. That's all I'm going to say about it. She goes a lot more in detail, but vegetable oils are very bad. And they're basically basically in everything that's processed. Um, If you're eating processed food, you're eating some kind of vegetable oil, basically. And so um, just be aware of that and how bad they are. And there are places around the world that, don't even allow the stuff that we put into our foods. And, um, that's crazy to me, but anyway, the, I think the biggest thing that stuck out to me, and and this is what I shared when we covered deep nutrition on the podcast was, uh, the nutrient deficiency 
and they did a they did a study with pigs where they deprived um, a, a mother pig of vitamin A for the entire gestation period with one particular litter of piglets and all the piglets were born without ice because their genetics weren't receiving vitamin A. And so they said, well, we don't need eyes. So their body didn't develop eyes. And then they went back to the next litter with that same pig and fed her, you know, the vitamin A that she was supposed to have. And all of her piglets came out with it with perfectly functional eyes, you know? And so just, and that, that was one study. I understand that, but just to think that nutrient deficiency can rewire the way your genes are expressed. And it's not just in utero. It's, you know, at, it, would it be called out utero? I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> after you're born, you know, even today, you know, it's still, as you grow, it still affects your gene expression. Uh, nutrient deficiency still affects your gene expression even after you're born. And so that was probably the biggest thing that stuck out to me was not getting the right food literally changes the way your genes are expressed and the way your genes act at a micro level. Awesome. I'll go through mine quickly. Uh, it's another Rob Wolf book, paleo solution. I, I would just say the paleo solution gave me a framework for eating. I'm not paleo anymore. Um, I'm paleo ish, I guess you could say, but, uh, you know, I'll have grains and whatnot. I'm not too scared of those things these days, but, uh, it just gave me a really good framework of eating, real food, I would guess is the, you know, just whole foods, uh, uh, avoiding a lot of those, uh, like vegetable oils, like, uh, Kyle's talking, like if you go to a restaurant, like you're getting vegetable oils, you, you almost can't avoid it unless you go to a, a specific restaurant. Um, so that was a really good book, uh, because I spent my first two years of college as a food nutrition science major, and you don't end up with any sort of framework from that. You learn a lot about the, the science of macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and all these things. But there's still, you don't like, you're not like headed towards this, like, here's what you should eat. You know, like it's, it's not so cut and dry like that. And so it takes authors like Rob Wolf and other people to put, put together these frameworks that, you know, help you make decisions and based off of principles, which I think is, is really good. So that's a good one. Uh, why we sleep we've talked about, um, that one's a more recent one I read and I think is pretty phenomenal just because it dives into everything about sleep and, uh, Matt Walker. I don't think that there's anyone who's done more research or smarter on the topic of sleep. And so that was a really great book. And then change your schedule, change your life, uh, was a really good book, uh, blanking on the offer author at the, at the minute, but that's the name of the book. And the reason I wanted to bring this one up is, uh, you know, the big takeaway was just having very consistent schedule. There are a lot of little takeaways, like, not eating late at night, which some people kind of know, but just having a super consistent schedule and really how to, uh, you know, schedule your day to change your life, if you will. But one thing that I noticed is that this whole, your humans aren't robots, right? You can't just uh, sit someone down and be like, you know, get enough sleep and no matter what time they're going to bed. And Kyle Hayes camp is a perfect example of this. So he's been around our community for a very long time. And he's also like, he's moved and, and had different jobs and whatnot. Like I don't need to dive into all of his personal life, but he did have a job where he worked extreme shift work. This was like a year or two ago. And he used to always share whoop data with me. And it would just be so crazy. Cause I can't remember his exact schedule, but it would be like, you know, two days of like normal life. Like we're, we're all living on a daily basis where we sleep at a normal time and then whatever. Then he had to like flip that schedule for the rest of the week for work. And his body would never, like never got used to it. Like he would send me screenshots of, of whoop and it would always be like 6% recovered, 7% recovered, 13% recovered. Like his HRV was always suppressed. His resting heart rate was always high and he was getting it. He would get enough sleep sometimes and like other times he wouldn't. And I, that's when I was like, you can't just, uh, yeah, I mean, there's been research on like, and, and Matt Walker mentioned in his book that shift work is like a, labeled as a carcinogen by the World Health Organization. Like, it's really bad for you. It's very bad for you to have an inconsistent schedule. And having seen that with one of our athletes, I think is cool. Um, but what's cooler about Kyle's story is he did move, did change uh, jobs, and now he has a more consistent schedule. He's, I, I just pulled up his Whoop data. It's funny, we can see each other's stuff. And like, he's sleeping, he's recovering great. Like, a lot has changed for him, which is awesome. And it's awesome to have him in the community. But 
it's funny how, how the body is just finicky like that, especially when you have data to back it up and you can see it with one of your own athletes. You're like, wow, yeah, this, this is not something you can't just get enough sleep and check that box and, and think everything's going to be okay. Like if you're not consistent in your schedule, something's still going to be screwed up. So I found that very, very interesting. And that's it for my takeaway. So seems like wired to eat kind of wins because it got mentioned twice. <laughs> I like it too. So it's uh, three votes yeah. for that one. It's a good nutrition get mentioned twice. Yeah, but I'm not recommending that for anyone to start. Yeah, <laughs> I want I, I like to, I want people to hit wired to eat first to to whet their appetite on, in the nutrition world, and then if they want to get into deep nutrition, go for it. Yeah, this is deep. It yeah. She she <laughs> named the book very appropriately. Uh, okay, workout twenty five minute lunch test. Uh, anyone want to brief it? I I can brief. Sure. It. Okay, oh. You got it. You got it. You got it. Sure, why not? So in 25 minutes, you are going to complete 400 meters worth of lunges with a weight vest or a backpack up to 20 pounds. Um, and then if you finish before the 25 minute time cap is up, then you have the rest of the time as rest. If you don't, then you go immediately into the part two, which part two is take that, west, that weight vest or backpack off and then do body weight lunges for 400 meters and then that is your score is the time that you get on part two awesome how do we attack it joe what do you what's what's the strategy <laughs> have AC? you done it <laughs> <laughs> no i've done a crap ton of lunges before so <laughs> with lunges you can't just go and do a bunch of reps i like to set a really really steady uh tempo with everything uh yeah this is gonna you're gonna it, it's gonna be tough during and then you're just gonna get worse after <laughs> yeah so the they're they're like pros and cons right so we can discuss it if you do the lunges really fast so you knock them out in 10 minutes you have 15 minutes to rest before you have to do the the actual scored portion of the workout if you go too steady and say it takes you 19 minutes or 20 minutes. Now you only have five minutes to rest before you start. Which camp would you want to be in, Joe? Would you want to be in like m maximizing rest, but you really have to push it? Or would you just want to like minimal rest and having paced it out? More minimal rest than, than, uh, and having paced it out. But I, I try and pace it out so that you at least get like 60 seconds of rest to lay down, elevate your feet or something, get the blood out of your legs for a little bit. And then hop on to the next part but if you if you go if you go t like too fast too hard um real quick then it's going to be really hard to recover even if you have like five six seven minutes to recover you're still going to be pretty tanked from it yeah damned if you do damned if you don't type of thing yeah actually what are your tips sounds like a meet yourself saturday it's gonna <laughs> hurt either way so <laughs> it is my a half tip, mile yeah yeah my tip is just go don't stop keep moving even if you have to pace it um the more you stop, the more your brain focuses on the pain that's going on in your legs. And so that's my goal um, is to just keep moving. And typically I finish around like the first part, like 12 minutes. So I've got a decent enough time to recover before I go the body weight. And then my goal for the body weight one is always beat your flipping first round because you're only on your body weight. You don't have, um, you don't have anything on. So yeah. And then, uh, I'm going to sweat on this one and shout out to Trampus because he made a tank after my I sweat like a man comment on last podcast. So hopefully I can do this with my new tank on and I'll take a photo. <laughs> uh, so back to Joe real quick. How do you perform a, a, a lunge properly? I was, it's funny. I was just about to talk about the form of it. Well, I just, I've seen this. So I originally created this workout um, in the military and I did it with a lot of airmen uh, in, so it was a lot of the, the, the meet yourself early meet yourself Saturday workouts were workouts I use as a physical training leader to try and get young airmen to not cheat the workouts I was trying to program. But so you're saying like not shuffle or what are you asking? Yeah. So there's a way it's almost like a duck walk to where you like never fully stand up. And I think when people hear for time or go fast, oh. that's what they end up doing. Especially if you're on like a softer surface, if you're like on a turf and you can kind of slam your knees on the ground and just like go. So I'll let Joe talk about how you should lunge properly. Uh, I think all of us are doing it, but just in case anyone out there doesn't know. 
Yeah, first make sure you're stepping farther far out enough uh, so that you're going to be wanting to use your hamstring and your glutes and not your quads because some people, they take too short of a step and then they're kind of like on the balls of their feet. But you need to step all the way forward out and then knee touch, your back knee touches the ground and then when you come up, your hips fully extend and you're fully standing, standing up. You need to, don't, don't stop and put your feet together and stand. You can step all the way through and you should step all the way through. That's called, if you, if you meet, meet your feet and step together, then that's called a wedding step, which is not as good. But you want to completely stand up, hips extended, and then go through. And um, so I pretty much stand at full height and then go to your next step. Yeah, that, that hip extension is the main thing I'm looking for if, when I see people doing this. If you want to do the wedding step, that's whatever. It's just going to slow you down, uh, but it's it's inefficient. <laughs> make, sure, make sure you're squeezing your glutes. Yeah. All right, Kyle, you got tips, tricks, strategies? I don't really know what I could add to I that. Know, I would so say I might go fast. I don't, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to say yet. Huh? Well, that's what I, I was going to say <laughs> is um, I would say warm up for it. Um, there you get, go. That's a good tip. Some, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Warm, warm up um, because there's going to be a, this, this one's going to hurt. You know, don't go into this cold. Just walk out and start doing lunges. That's a bad idea, um, especially for this many lunges. Um, obviously, well, I don't know about obviously for you guys, but I would rather do this at a track where it's nice and flat instead of in my hill of a front yard. But I can't do that because of the Rona. Um, all the all the tracks are closed down. So going to have to do it in the yard and so i'll probably have to be doing the waiting step because i'll be on an incline going different directions so i'll have to be keeping my balance but anyway yeah, I, I need to find a new place uh, we just had lunges and bear crawls and hard to kill on the first weekend i was just doing it on concrete and i'm like this is dumb like I, did you I, wear I, knee sleeves that's what my other question is because no, i was like i should have. i have concrete yeah, yeah i should have um i didn't think that far ahead Okay. Uh, I guess my advice, since I think everything's been covered, I would say listen to an audio book during the 20 vest, 20 pound vested 400 meters, and then listen to your favorite jams during the scored portion. So something that's going to slow you down and help you pace a little bit. Like Joe said, um, if you are afraid you'll go too fast and then go as fast as you can on the, on the 400 body weight. Cause that's, that's time. And I think maybe the leaderboard actually works with this workout. What do you think? Probably. Yeah. Maybe. Would be hard to cheat, but I, you know, who knows? Yeah. I know that the leaderboard's so hard and we, I could pull it up right now and it'll probably be like, someone did this in two minutes. I'm like, Damn it. Carl. <laughs> 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 Why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the always the random person lunges. who like messed up the the leaderboard for everyone. It's happened like on every workout. They're like, oh, I scaled it down to forty meters. I'm like, then don't enter a time. Don't enter a time on the on the leaderboard. Um, anyway, that's a it's a gripe for a different day. All right, guys, that is it for this one. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you want to support what we're doing, go to garagemathlete.com and snag a free trial, free for 14 days. You can try things out, see if you like any of our, what do we got, like eight training tracks now, and uh, see if we have one for you that's going to help you meet your goals. Helps us to continue to do podcasts and provide awesome programming and content and everything else that we're doing. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate everyone listening. If you do enjoy the podcast, leave a five-star review, positive comment. And that is it. Thanks for listening to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.